Time to start episode 100 of the Comics Are Great show, and I will introduce the panel that we've assembled for this episode, and thank you guys so much for being here. First, on my right, co-hosting with me today is Greg Schiegel of the Stuff Said Show.com. Hi, everybody. <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. I don't know, I don't know, I, I don't know what my responsibilities are, but I'm prepared for them. And, I mean, just indulge me for a moment, if you guys could give, me a, uh, give Greg a round of applause so that we can pick it up on the mic so people can hear that there's a live studio audience here. Thank you. Because, yes, this was my dream when I started the show at the library. Was that somebody have we... me on? Yes. Wow. That is uh, to, <laughs> to do glorious. This in, in front of a live studio audience and maybe, maybe get Greg if, oh, dare to dream. But Greg Shegel also, not only do you do, do a podcast about comics. I do. It's called Stuff Said, where I talk to people in the world of comics, cartooning, and beyond. And, uh, and, and you've had a lot of, you know, uh, very important people on your show, like Rex Lee. Yes, Rex <laughs> Lee was on, and he is... He was a character. <laughs> yeah, I would recommend you start with that episode necessarily. but well, Yeah, that would not... I, I mean, you could start with that episode, episode 41. Yes. And I remember it's that number for a very specific reason. But I say start from the beginning and listen to all 40-some-odd uh, hours of it. And it comes out every month. Every month at StuffSaidShow.com. On the 15th. Although yeah. this summer, I'm going to be releasing... Uh, I'm going to go bi-monthly for a couple of months. Oh. Because uh, summer schedule. Why not? Which we're going to talk a little bit more about in a second. But you also, Ooh. to give your credentials, you also work on the SpongeBob comics. I do. I'm a for... regular contributor to SpongeBob Comics, published by United Plankton Pictures, distributed by Bongo Comics. And you do a lot of the art of, uh, like, like licensing art for SpongeBob, do you not? Uh, I have. It's, it's, yes. I worked at Nickelodeon for about two and a half years almost, and I did a lot of work that ended up on t shirts and stationery and greeting cards and packaging and things like that. Mm -hmm. I've drawn some coloring books with SpongeBob, some story books, drawn a lot of SpongeBob SquarePants. And finally, we have to talk about picks, if you could hold it up, please. Of course. This is the new book that, that, that Greg has released here at Kids Read Comics 2014. You can find it in the Artist Alley. What is picks in a nutshell? I'll read from the back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, picks is a superpowered teenager with your standard state of, of superpowers, which is probably not the right way to describe it. But she claims that she is a fairy princess, that her father is the king of the fairy kingdom. And while everybody seems to be fine with the fact that she has superpowers and wears a costume most of the time, when she starts talking fairy princess stuff, they think she's nuts. Uh, so the story, the, the overall story will explore whether she is or is not this fairy princess. But this particular book is a series of odd adventures where things that shouldn't be moving are moving, things that shouldn't be talking are talking and things that shouldn't be happening are happening. And she uh, faces them with uh, grit and a smile, if you can do both of those things. Uh, I think Zeta the Space Girl proved that you could, right? So I, I'd say if you're a fan of Zeta the Space Girl, you probably would enjoy picks, and you should go check out and get, get two. Um, one sure. for you, one for a friend. Okay, so cred credentials established. Now let's move on to yes, Laura please. Given. <laughs> Laura Given, liblaura 5 dot blogspot.com. Blogspot blogspot.com. Thank you. I, I could always never remember if it's WordPress or Blogspot. Liblora5.blogspot.com. Yeah. Liblora5 on Twitter. Yes. Liblora5 on Instagram. Yes. And you I are have branded a... branded myself on every platform. <laughs> it's good branding. Thank you. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like with, with uh, Dave Roman and Yay Time. You know, just type in Yay Time and everything will come up. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like with, with uh, Dave Roman and Yay Time. You know, just type in Yay Time in any service and he's there as that thing. And now there's a reason that there's the number five. You got a thing for fives. I do have a thing for fives. It's kind of a long story with uh, way back to college days, but we got now. Time. What? <laughs> 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 but now I collect the number five so if you in my house I have a lot of things with the number five on it and I look for fives out in the world and that just makes me happy to see fives out in the world and there's a hashtag five spotting <laughs> that you use that, that I'm the only one who posts to but <laughs> <laughs> but yes I use a hashtag five spotting so as we've traveled to um, kids kids read comics so I've been looking for fives and you know posting on Instagram with my five spotting hashtag we could go into a whole episode just about like the shapes of numbers and like what that means. You, you know, we were at Challengers Comics and the front of on our way here and the front with the big panels by Chris Giruso. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> well, that's his panels were the first where I've noticed that a lot of people use the number five as their ear shape in the middle of the ear. Oh, did you just draw? Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. Craig just drew an ear shape on his paper, and it sure. looks like the number five. And so, I, I don't know. I just really like that. Oh, you know, I, I, no, I noticed some other people doing that today too. So, 
<laughs> but you are a librarian. We didn't even establish what you do for a living. <laughs> this is this I'm crazy here lady as who an loves the number five. Expert of the number five. That's what I'm representing <laughs> at this table. Which wait for the second half of the show. There's a big payoff about that. But no, you you are a librarian in Minneapolis. In, in Minnesota, I oh. um, live on the Minneapolis side of the world, but I work on the St. Paul side of the world. If you know that they're twin cities in mm. Minnesota, and just north of St. Paul is where um, my uh, school is, and I'm a K-8 librarian. So I like a lot of things K-8, that whole range from picture books to YA and graphic novels and middle grade novels and all sorts of things. And the reason we know each other is because you are also a huge youth comics advocate. Yes. You do a lot of work with people like Colby Sharp and the Nerdy Book Club and John Shue and like just a lot of, and you have your own advocacy that you do through liblora5.blogspot.com. So uh, librarians who are listening to the show after the fact can connect with you by looking for you, uh, liblora5, everywhere. and thank you for being here. Uh, and then finally, we have Aaron Helmrich, who has been on the show before. Aaron Helmrich, who is one of the main forces behind this event this weekend, guys. So the, everything that you've been doing this weekend was made possible in part by a generous grant of time yes. of Aaron Helmrich <laughs> of the Ann Arbor District Library. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Woo-hoo. And it's you're one of the best events ever. So it's oh. one of our favorite things to do. You are, you are a teen librarian. I am. I'm a teen librarian. I'm also a production librarian, which What means does that, that mean? What do you make boxes? I produce Good question. things <laughs> like events, website content, um, experiences, anything that can be produced. Which is one of the unique things that Ann Arbor District yes, Library does absolutely. more so than other libraries absolutely. is that they, they put their librarians, they, they empower them and give them agency to create content and partner with people, like with, with schmucks like me, to absolutely. create yeah. <laughs> yeah, podcasts, language. Jersey podcasts. language. <laughs> <laughs> All right, would Shlemiel work yeah, better? Sure. <laughs> Perfect. All right, but uh, anyway, so okay, so um, you know, the question is going to be raised. Here we are at Kids Read Comics 2014 at the Ann Arbor District Library, comics.adl.org, kidsreadcomics.org. Uh, the question, everybody's going to be wondering, how are you guys finding it? And I would love, the, here's the great thing about this panel Aaron helps put the show together. Laura, you're just here. For the fun of it? Here with my family, for the fun of it. And then I roped into a, one, of the, one of the actual panels. Uh, and then, Greg, you're an actual tabling artist. I'm working my hustle. <laughs> so, who, uh, who wants to, does any kind of like, just like real briefly, uh, thoughts, takeaways, reflections, and I know this is tricky because I'm here, uh, and you want to <laughs> not disappoint me, but, uh, but like the highlights for you of what's been going on so far, and we're only partway through the day, but like, I like that it starts at noon so I could sleep in. <laughs> That's a highlight. <laughs> is, that, is that cool? No, so far it's, it's, been, it's been lovely. Everybody's very friendly. All the, all the people in other tables, neighboring tables are, are a lot of fun. The people who are walking around seem genuinely interested and, and are paying attention. That's good. <laughs> is that different than other comic conventions? I don't, know, I don't know if it's necessarily different. It just the, the scale is smaller. So you have more of an opportunity to actually talk to somebody and, and see where the, the Venn diagrams uh, cross over. I had a nice conversation earlier today about Disney movies, an oh, extensive yeah. conversation about Disney movies, yeah. which you don't always have the time to do when you're at a, a hectic mainstream show. Right, where you're just like pumping out the sketches. You're sketches. pumping out the sketches or just managing traffic or what have you. Not that it doesn't get crowded, because it did. It was from like noon to one, it was quite a scene. Yeah, it got pretty crazy in there uh, on the first floor of the library today. Um, But yeah, everybody seems happy, which is nice. (laughs) Well, that, 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 in my experience, that is a distinguishing feature from some, some other comic conventions. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of people wearing shirts that identify their fandoms, which is fun, because then you know exactly what to talk to them about. <laughs> like what? Like what do you mean? Well, there, there are certainly uh, kids and adults wearing superhero shirts, but I saw a, a young lady walking around with a smile t-shirt, so mm. I knew, all right, I know where you're at. Yep. Uh, a lot of Hello Kitty shirts, which makes me think Jacob Shabbat, who's sitting next to me, is uh, a hero at this show. Yes. Because uh, Hello Kitty, very popular. Yes. And, and and that is, I mean, like the the fact that you see people wearing shirts for uh, books published by the trade publishing industry rather than just Green Lantern, just Superman, right? You yeah. see, like more of a mix here, don't you? Uh, I've noticed it. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. But I'm also paying attention to shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Which you can ask Greg about more after the panel. Well, your wife is wearing a very cool shirt. Of a, it's a small yes. one. Yes. 
Oh, that's, that's right. Yeah. Anne is in the audience. And yes, she's wearing the uh, Small World shirt that we got at Disneyland a while back. That's a cool shirt. It's a cool shirt. Yeah. Is that Mary Blair? I was going to say that's Mary Blair. Yeah. yeah. The best. Uh, okay. So, Laura, uh, Highlights Reflections. One, uh, what, what I love is that it just feels really informal and that kids can really, kids and families can really be connected to the action that's happening here. And, like, we had a lovely, intimate room with Matt Holm earlier, and that... That's just not something that can happen everywhere. And and again, everybody was happy and kind of joining in and the drobstickle course earlier. Oh, yeah, Kids happened. participating and yeah. um, just a feel that everybody can kind of be a part of it and feel like in this intimate setting, it's very fun. I was totally in a Vine video, first Vine ever. Laura <laughs> right. did a Vine of the drobstickle course. I felt honored. <laughs> <laughs> more and more internet famous every day. If, if anybody missed it, the Dropsicle course, which, gosh, we might have to do an encore performance pr tomorrow, uh, which was uh, it was a drawing game show that Greg hosted where uh, the audience members, kids in the audience, would come up to the flip charts and draw random things. And then we, the professional cartoonists, had to race the clock to turn that random thing into something that was actually decipherable. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Hey, thanks. And a three-way tie. And a three-way tie, yes. And a three-way tie. I got to, complete happenstance. And, 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 and through it, we got, to draw, we got to draw Abraham Lincoln getting stepped on by a giant boot while he was holding a laser gun. Uh, yeah. On, on a $5 bill. I was still standing on a $5 bill. Yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, okay, Aaron, I mean, from your side of the... Th of, of so the from our side of the um, coin, it's been interesting because if you've come in the past, we always had all the artists on the third floor. Mm -hmm. And series of things, including the public elevator being broken, has forced the issue, and I think it turned out delightful. It's even better than, it's so nice that people can walk in and you cannot ignore what's happening anymore because it's right there, um, and the energy, and there's more light, it's cooler temperatures. Um, we can use a megaphone on the first floor, that's always one of my favorite things about <laughs> conference. And, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, and then the audience doesn't see this, but we also love taking care of the artists. That's always a good thing, too. So we like to feed and drink and give them water and yeah, make them guys, happy. And show us where the bathrooms <laughs> exactly. are. Exactly. Yeah. I never would have guessed that it would have been set up a different way as a first-time person at this um, festival. Is it a festival celebration? Oh, my yeah, gosh. What do you call it? Oh, don't even start. We yeah. don't even we know. We just started. Okay. Okay. We it's started. Our, it's our sixth it's year. Gathering. It's our it's sixth just year. So wonderful is it to walk in and see those yeah. tables? It's, is it a convention? Is it a festival? Is it a celebration? It's cult. kids read comics. Yeah. It's kids read comics. It's kids read comics. That's what we call it right oh, now. Nice. So that's what it's going to be. That's what our, our nonprofit status is is called. So we'll just oh, go fine. with that. But since <laughs> gender was brought up earlier, I do want to mention. I mean, I love seeing all uh, families and whatnot, but I do definitely particularly like seeing the number of dads that we definitely see come to this event with kids. That is in, an interesting in a, um, different way. So yeah. that's great. Is that not typically the case? Um, for library events, it's a harder audience sometimes. Yeah, you know, and so it's a good, it's great to see. I can just tell that there's a lot of folks that are parents that are like, I'm really excited about my comics and things that I'm into, and now I get to share it. So it's a neat, it's a neat thing to see. So cool, yeah. That, that, and and going back just to something you said a second ago, yeah. All the artists had lunch, which is like super, <laughs> super cool. Not that is a differentiating factor between Kids Read Comics and other comics conventions. That when I go to you know other shows that I won't name, uh, they don't feed me, and <laughs> they don't feed me like Jerusalem Garden. <laughs> uh, so okay, well, let's see. We've got we've got enough time to. Or I, I wonder if really briefly, Greg, because there's young people in the room. Yeah, I see him with my and, eyes. And I've, I've seen a lot of the interactions going on at the tables. I wonder if you spent five, 10 minutes on this. Okay. Uh, a lot of the interactions going on at the tables throughout the day, kids showing their portfolios or their sketches or their characters to these different artists. And here we have you, this wonderful resource, this guy who worked for Nickelodeon Magazine for a long time, worked on SpongeBob comics. Uh, what, what, what piece of advice do you give to some of these young people who say, like, I want, I'm gripped by a thing. You were gripped by a thing when you were 10. Yeah. 11. Even 10? earlier, sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and you had to find your own way because this was pre-internet, so pre there was really and, and it was very difficult to get out to conventions and meet all these people. Yep. Um, for the young people who are here, the young people who are listening on YouTube, what's one thing you'd say to them? Uh, I, I will say the thing I said to a young man earlier today. Who I, was, I was looking at his work, and this is this is an interesting piece of information only because it's the sort of thing. All right, I'll explain it for you. <laughs> Anything you're drawing is made up of smaller drawings, smaller components. So if you're going to draw a figure, you start with a stick figure and build that up with shapes, and then you eventually get your finished figure. 
The point being, you cannot draw the finished figure until you've drawn the construction and the stuff underneath, the how-to part. And I know it feels like, and this was something that this young man's mother brought up, is that you know, he wants to do the drawing finished because it feels like if you're drawing a stick figure, you're not really drawing. If you're drawing the part, you're not really drawing. That is really drawing, doing all that stuff that gets you to that final piece. And all your final artwork will be better as a result. So I always point to How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way because that's the book that really, uh, I can't think of the word right now, but puts it out in its simplest form, how to draw figures, certainly dynamic superhero figures if that's your thing, but just drawing human figures. They're more complicated than we all think, and to draw them right, there's proportions and dynamics and things of that nature, and you have to draw from the bottom up. A metaphor I sometimes use is you can't decorate a cake until you've baked it, uh, so everybody has to bake their cakes before you can start putting frosting on it, and everybody just wants to frost the cake because frosting is awesome, <laughs> but too much frosting by itself, that's a, a bit much. You need some cake. <laughs> If you listen I'm to the pro, stuff, I am pro cake. <laughs> if, you, if you listen to the stuff said show, one of Greg's superpowers is coming up with metaphors for anything. I got my car's broken on the side of the road, Greg. What do I do? I mean, I got or the tire's flat. How do I change the tire? When I when I was working at Marvel, I'd come up with this superhero team that I never actually even designed, but they were metaphors and simoline, <laughs> and uh, one had the power of metaphors and one had the power of similes. Both being pretty similar in their in their power set, but I just like those names. <laughs> and now you gave it to the world. Well, you know, uh, the world should have it. That's that's something I'm that's I'm something I'm sharing. I've got other secrets. Don't worry. <laughs> but that would be the all advice. Right. The advice is uh, drawing is is it's not all the uh, the flashy stuff. There's there's you know, and and when you start figuring out the construction, you can you can draw anything. Everything is made of shapes. Okay, so I'm going to go home tonight, yeah. and I'm going to start sketching. Yeah, I'm going to start working on, on my construction lines and under drawing, and then I just get a job, right? So, yeah, and then of course. Stanley no, comes no, that's to my it. house and says, "Hey, come on out. Yeah. I got a job for you." Absolutely. Really? Yeah, it's those two steps. <laughs> No. Draw, draw four shapes, get what, a job. What I no? was implying, what I was trying to drive at is, how do you get work? Oh, that, <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, we could sit here for another hour and a half. Can you um, do it in five, five minutes? In five. In, out of respect to Laura. Yeah, absolutely. Only out of respect for Laura. Uh, you get work by, you know, this, this will be the piece of advice. Although everybody that I've seen so far is really young, so they, they probably shouldn't be thinking about this stuff just yet because... They're young. But mom and dad think about this Mom and dad stuff. think about it. So something to think about is there is the dream job, which is drawing your own comic or drawing Spider-Man or whatever it is. But there are ways to work as a professional drawer that aren't necessarily that dream job but are still pretty great. So, for example, I learned uh, about the licensing artwork world, which is drawing characters. And maybe it's not the Spider-Man comic, but you're drawing Spider-Man for... Trading cards, I believe you did some of that, correct? Yes, I did. Uh, or coloring books, or story books. I mean, there's, there are ways to do artwork that aren't specifically comics. You earn money, maybe not a living, but you earn some money. <laughs> You've drawing. got a doorman. We can say that. I do have a doorman. <laughs> for my apartment only. It's weird. The building Whoa! doesn't. Yeah, I have a specific doorman I've hired for my, my apartment. Um, uh, but yeah, there are ways to work as a, as a professional person drawing pictures. They're not the easiest jobs to get, but they exist. I mean, there are, uh, here's, here's something that nobody ever thinks about. I remember looking into this at one point. There are workbooks, math and, and spelling workbooks. There are drawings in those books. Somebody did those drawings and they got paid for it. I don't know how much, but somebody got paid to do the, the drawings in the you know, grade four math book where there's like a duck adding two plus two. Mr. Sheagle? If you're doing that in, at grade four, you, you, know, you should be doing more than two plus two. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. All right, I, I, I messed up that metaphor. I'm sorry. Okay. But Mr. Sheagle, here yeah. I am. I'm the, young, I'm the young artist coming at you. And you How old are you, young man? Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 15. 15. Oh, you're uh, okay. Mr. Sheagle, my voice no. is cracking. 15, you're, you're, you're talking deep at 15. Oh, you didn't know me at 15. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, so I come to you and I'm like, oh, you give me those advice about uh, uh, getting jobs, but uh, those, those all sound okay. Stay in school, kid. But... <laughs> But if I'm not doing the dream job, I failed. I failed because now, oh, now I got to do textbooks. That stinks. That's like a job. Yeah. So is so is the dream job. 
What? Yeah, the dream job, the word job is in it. Like, there's more after the word dream. So even the dream job is a job. Uh, there's work. Somebody's relying on you to get the dream job done in time. I think the dream job for all of us is to sleep in and watch cartoons. <laughs> Nobody's really getting paid to do that. Even the people that make cartoons don't get to sleep in and watch cartoons. There's that Simpsons episode where the animator visits Bart's school, and then the principal's saying, like, tell the kids about how much hard work it takes to be an animator. He's like, this is the easiest job ever. I mostly just eat candy and watch R-rated movies. <laughs> <laughs> You can do that. You will not earn a living. I mean, it, it, there is a job. I mean, you know, people will say to draw a comic book page takes something in the range of, you know, six to 14 hours or, or depending on how fast or slow you are. That's a job. You're yeah. sitting at a desk and you're working. Uh, it's a different job than data entry. But somebody who really likes data entry is going to think sitting for eight hours drawing is torture. That, that is absolutely true. The grass is always greener, dot, dot, dot. Okay. So thank you for giving us a, uh, a treatise in the facts of life, Greg. <laughs> you got it, buddy. Also, I don't know anything. <laughs> But, okay, but there's another reason I've assembled this panel here, because we haven't heard much from uh, Arm wrestling? Lauren. Uh, yes, the thumb wrestling, actually, four <laughs> ways. Uh, but with, with only, like, 20, 25 minutes to go. I'm sorry. Greg, no. Greg, <laughs> I, I'm saying this public line, episode 100 of, of Comics Great. I love you very much. Oh, thanks, buddy. And this is an intervention. <laughs> <laughs> I talk too much, I know. <laughs> no, this is, this is, I have two librarians here. Yeah. You are going to ALA yeah, next, next week. week. Ooh, next week. Okay. You are doing kids' comics that you want to get in front of more kids. And something I've said in the Comics Great Show repeatedly, and I will say it again for emphasis and because it cannot be overstated, is librarians are the single most important group of people in the, the, for the future of our medium. I do not disagree. Okay. So, 100%. Now, now, <laughs> so now, what I'm wondering is if Aaron and Laura can give, help give my friend Greg advice, I'll take A, it. about being at ALA, and B, about how to get picks in front of y young people who use your libraries. How do you get in there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First, it's important to say, I'm going to let Laura take this, but it's ALA in Vegas in June. So that's a whole other. <laughs> it's air conditioned. It better be air yeah, conditioned. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm worried about that heat. Yeah. Um, thinking about the comics that I buy for my library and for my students, um, I'm really looking at that K-8, and I want to know, like, who's it for? What's my target audience? And sometimes I can look at a comic and I can really tell. Um, sometimes I can't quite tell, but I know the person who's created it, and so I know kind of where it falls. Otherwise, I do a lot of reading on my own, and so I read. Otherwise, if I can't, you know, I can't obviously read everything, so then I go to people I trust, so like some of the people that... You were mentioning earlier who I'm connected to on Twitter and online, and um, I trust their opinion, and I find out, oh, they've read it, and they've added it to their elementary library connection, collection, so I know that that fits for me. Um, but I think another thing that Jersey did, like right at the beginning when he was talking about picks, because I haven't read picks yet, and I didn't know about it, and for good or ill, you made a comparison to Zeta. Yep. And that stuck in my brain like, oh, I kind of get what kind of character this might be and who my readership might be. And I know as, from the artist standpoint, you might want to not want to be making those comparisons because this is your character and these are, this is your backstory for this character. And this. But um, it is helpful in certain times for me to understand what kind of reader am I thinking about. For yeah, yeah, to have that, that yeah, comparison. Yeah, that little sure. connection. No, that's good company. I'm not. I'm not complaining about no, the comparison no, no, no. at all. No, no, no. I'm not. Yeah. I love Zeta. Nope. I was just saying you're a hack, Greg. That's all. Yeah. yeah, that's true too. I said I didn't know anything. But it's an entry point for some people to think about. Well, what kind of reader might I be thinking about for this comic? Can I tell a quick Zeta story? Just real quick. Yes, yes. please. I was at uh, Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle this past March, and there was a little girl dressed as Zeta, adorable. And Chris Jerusso, who was who was right next to me, pointed her out. So we both said, Zeta. This girl was so thrilled to be recognized by anybody in this outfit. And she had the hair, it was, per it was a perfect, if I had a camera with me, I would have taken a picture and, and tweeted it uh, out to, to, I'm completely blanking on the name. Yes. Uh, and 
but it was great. It was great. And it was, it was one of those things where you're like, that's the, you know, if, if I ever see somebody dressed as Pix at a con, I might melt into a puddle of goo because that's the coolest thing in the world. Well, that's episode 200. Boom, I just turned a Zeta story into a Pix yes. story. Wow. <laughs> well, my tip for you at ALA is just give away lots of free stuff. That's, that's that is <laughs> what I plan to do. There are the librarians who come, and that is, you know, they just want to fill up their bag. That's my plan. Um, and become, are you familiar with the Yalsa Great Graphic Novels Committee? I am aware of it. Okay. I know you Raina can, wins all their awards. Yes, you can look them up <laughs> online and maybe, you know, follow them all on Twitter and get to know them because even though it is specifically a young adult list, all of those people are doing kids' comics, Young too. adults start at what age? 12, 12 okay. to 18 is the, is the, the actual definition. So the Venn definition. diagram of middle grade and young adults sort Totally of overlaps. Over. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. There's another celebration at ALA for the Eisner Grant that's happening on Saturday. I'll be there. Saturday, yeah. yep. And that would be another great place to connect with librarians. I RSVP'd the other night. I'll That's tell you in general, like Yalsa, if you see Yalsa people, those are they're very connected and they Corner tell them. each other, yes. Okay. Um, and you know, they're gonna be some of your big, biggest advocates as Great. far as, you know, hand selling. No, this is this is actually very good information because I was just thinking this the other day, and, and I'll be careful how I phrase everything. Uh, I just I've I've read a bunch of books. I read a lot of the books that Scholastic puts out or what have you, uh, because I consider that the, the school I'm gonna be swimming in. And everybody thanks the same sort of three or four people, the, the editor, the agent, this sort of small group of people. And I, and I was thinking about how it's very interesting that this very small group of people is essentially shaping what the book market and the library market thinks of as comics. Yeah. And I was thinking about it, I don't know, do my comics fit into that definition? So it is nice to know you can sort of sidestep that and go to the librarians directly <laughs> yes. and avoid these gatekeepers. I was going to say, Laura, we were having a conversation just before we started recording about this very topic, about how important it is to make a personal connection with the librarians, right? I, I would say that's crucial. I mean, I've purchased so many things where I've made a personal connection with a comic artist on Twitter and maybe even made a connection in a way that I can make a connection for my students, have them Skype, and of course then I buy a bunch of books and my kids get really excited. And so, yeah, definitely my, my graphic novel cl collection, you can see that it is heavily with the people that I'm connected with on, on Twitter. Well, and that's There's, not to say that, like, oh, you got to get into the Liblora 5 Mafia in order no. to get in on the bookshelf. There's only five members. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, of course, I read, you know, reviews, and I'm talking of to course. other people, too, but definitely. But it becomes it becomes something that helps you sift through things. Like, you, the, the word you used to me is, like, when I see the name Jared Krasoska on something, I know what to expect. Like, because you know the guy, you know what he represents, you know what his stuff is about, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I know I know who my readers are going to be and who I can like, build word of mouth with and how I can get that out to kids. And I also know, you know that he does... I, I know about his outreach, that he's going to have um, his webcasts every so often that I can have kids join in on. Mm -hmm. That's another part about um, getting connected with schools. I mean, he's kind of a model of somebody to look for of like putting things out there that school librarians and teachers can help connect kids to the actual artist, and that makes a huge difference. So, in summary, yes, is it important to have a presence on one of the different networks? <laughs> this is part of the intervention, isn't it? Yes, this is a big I, part I, of the I intervention. Would, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I'm on Twitter, man. <laughs> What else do you want from me? <laughs> You're on there, but but I'm saying that like but reaching out and connecting and conversing, becoming conversant with people, right? I, yeah, I have a weird thing with Twitter. Is if somebody asks me to answer a question on Twitter, I will try and email you directly and take it off the public <laughs> the public forum. I'm I'm a little old school that way. I I, I will have a one on one because I I hey I'm a little wordy, folks. <laughs> so I need more than 140 characters, often. Oh, that that's that's where you have to learn to edit, I guess. Uh, come on. Man. <laughs> I in think, real life, I got to edit too. I, I think mean, that can be okay to make that personal connection offside once the connection is yeah, established. Sure. But having that presence that oh, you we're going to be emailing on. all the time now. Well. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I can vouch for this, Greg. Greg will email you six times a day. <laughs> no, stop it. That's terrible. <laughs> now that this is now, once this is over, George, you're never going to hear from me again. <laughs> See you at ALA. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, what about you? I mean, like, what, how do artists or, or authors get on your radar? Or just me. Besides Yelsa. Um, well, <laughs> it's interesting. I think the other thing I do is use a lot of publishers. So, like, 
I know that there's certain publishers out there right now that are that are pretty much everything that they're going to put out is going to be, you know. So obviously, get a really good publisher. I guess. Well, that is begs the question. The <laughs> okay, so here's the question. I'm self-publishing this book. Okay, well then. So we are very lucky. Me. Yes. Um, no pun we, intended. One of the things that's also great about having this event here is that we shop from all of you guys that are here. So, you know, that's one of the ways that we can kind of stay on top of it. But Facebook is still a big, librarians love Facebook, and they do share a lot of stuff with each other. So that is still a really, you know, effective way in the back end, you know, to get to people. And it's also easier for... Um, parents to share sometimes too, like especially even with just this event when we were putting up the Kids Read Comics posts, you know, they were getting a lot of hits, you know, that way from other parents that were seeing it and, you know, because obviously they're under 13, they're not supposed to be on there, so. Now here's a super techie question that maybe you may want to cut this when it's said. Hmm? Is there a speci are there specific distributors that librarians work with um, yeah, I mean, the biggest one is Baker and Taylor that, you know, one of those particular. So, yeah, having your stuff be there. I'll tell you, without getting into any, you know, like how you feel about Amazon, Amazon is still a source that people use to at least look things up. Sure. Whether they buy it from there. Um, and so that is a helpful place to still be because um, it just proves you exist. Yeah, yeah. You know, to some people, that's it's sort the of their... It's biggest marketplace for in the world, people, right? It's yeah. An element of credibility. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, everything has changed so much with with com. It's like, you know, it's really exciting because there's so many really good stories being told and there used to be such a very small pool or it was just you know, newspaper comics that were collected. And so there's so many more parents that are looking. And I think that's another angle is that, um, like I was saying earlier, you know, parents that are really into comics, you know, figuring out how they're finding out about things too is, is the way. Because a lot of times they're the ones that are, you know, hand selling the things to their kids as well. Absolutely. We've lost half the room. <laughs> that's because they were young children. <laughs> this guy's right there. That guy's still here. <laughs> Uh, okay, but where, 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 where are you, Laura? Uh, for uh, no, no, no. I said, what about Great. ordering for you? Yeah, well, ordering for me. Um, Mackin is another jobber for libraries, and they are local to Minnesota for me, but they are across the country. So I know. I mean, they're another big one. Um, you guys, neither of you use Diamond. No. I feel like that's not a school library. I've, I've only recently understood what Diamond even is. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I guess the question I would have for you, Jersey, is what kind of discount do they give? Oh, that's, that's a good question. That really yeah. is the, the the deciding factor, and that's one of the um, it's one of the challenges when when libraries were first starting to get graphic novels. Is a lot of places wanted to support their local comic book shop, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you couldn't reasonably ask them to give you the discount that you're going to be getting, you know, from a Baker and Taylor, which can be forty to fifty percent. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, the main thing about that, of course, is that we can just buy that much more with whatever the amount is that we have. So that's pretty much, you know. And then I think there's also the streamline aspect of not buying from as many vendors. So, like, I think a lot of places might make those choices mm -hmm. based my, on that, too. My understanding of Diamond is it's based on publisher and quantity. Okay. So, if you're order, certain publishers discount to a certain amount at a certain quantity. Uh, okay. But I don't know the details because I don't run a store. So, yeah. for the young people who are still in the room who were listening to Greg earlier talk about this whole, like, process of getting jobs and doing jobs that maybe are less glamorous than other jobs in order to keep the roof over your head, there's another layer of complexity on this whole thing where you have to, after getting published, then you have to worry about what distributor you're going to go through and how much that distributor takes from you, how much the distributor discounts to the, the eventual Well, that, that's buyer. a particular interest of mine as a self-publisher who is currently planning to distribute, self-distributing uh, so I'm curious about the distribution part because Diamond is the main distributor for the mainstream direct market comic market, but my book is not for that market. So I, I, that is why I asked the question and why I thought maybe this is boring for everybody, but well, it no, might be it, interesting. It, no, I, I, think, I think we can, uh, if I can borrow a metaphor from you. Please do. I uh, love metaphors. Is, is, is think of it this way. Um, so why even have a distributor? Why, why, what was the purpose of it? Imagine, who here, has anybody in this room ever sent a letter? <laughs> okay. Now, that takes a little bit longer than sending an email, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it takes a little bit longer than sending an email. I'll be email. the audience. Now, imagine doing 300, 400 letters a day. 
right? Woo! Yes, that, that's why you get a distributor, because the distributor yeah. just picks up the books from the printer, and they, they do all that mailing for you, so you don't have to deal with it. Because, yes, a self-publisher could put each book in the mail, and that's actually how I got started back at, way back in 1994. Uh, but it was, it was a pain. Yeah, I'm a little behind the eight ball. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so with only, you know, we can wrap it up in the next five minutes. Uh, so I guess if you guys now, no, no, I had Greg give young people a piece of advice, the one piece of advice. What's the one piece of advice you give to cartoonists who want to be more involved and in get their work into the collections of libraries besides come to Kids Read Comics? Because that is, that's a given. That's a gimme. As Aaron just pointed out, if you come to Kids Read Comics and table, then you, you get shopped. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, um well, I think starting local, I mean, you know, one of the things about doing school visits, beside, aside from a public library visit, mm -hmm. is it's a captive audience. And we don't have that advantage. You know, people voluntarily come here. So the captive audience, you know, they may be a little resistant at first, but they usually end up loving you. By the, I mean, every time an author comes to the local school system here, I mean, we have a huge run, and it may have been somebody that none of those kids had ever heard of before, but they liked you, and they thought you were hilarious, and they had, you know, those one-on-one -on -one moments. So I think that even, you know, and then talking to your local librarian, and if you do have a comic book store, you know, and that sort of, you know, to get it going, at least on a smaller scale. How do I talk to my local librarian? Do I just go to the circ desk and say, give me a librarian? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's helpful to be a nice, really regular user at the library that starts a rapport. I actually like to tell a story. Um, Mark Crilly, who's local, uh, uh, the Kiko books, he used to come in with his dad, his children when he was a stay at well, he, he's still, I think, a stay at home now, dad now. But he would come in with his kid all the time when I worked in another library and never talked to him. You know, he never needed anything. And I always was curious about what he was up to. And it turned out. I had been looking at one of his books, and I'd looked at one of them, and I'd seen the drawing in the back. And then, like, six months later, I saw it again and realized that was him. And so I was the one that went up to him and said, hey, do you do programs? And he'd never thought of doing them. And so, um, yeah, he didn't come up and say, hi, I wrote a book. And, you know, so don't be afraid to do that. But, um, you know, because you're not always going to have somebody who recognizes your picture off a book flap. But <laughs> right. um, being, uh, you know, a regular user and then getting to know and finding Finding out who buys for what collections, for example. If what are those someone, people called? We did um, an episode ca about this a while ago. Who's your back. selector? Choose yes. your selector. <laughs> yes. Um, your some selector. places, you know, it's a librarian. Some places they're calling my central selector. But finding out who buys and maybe making sure they buy. Like, do they even have that collection, hopefully? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you can plant that seed if they don't. Suddenly but. having flashbacks to sending five-page samples to all the... Editors and assistant editors and publishers. But instead of doing that, now yeah. you're doing that to librarians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> librarians are the new editors, yeah. right? Oh, my gosh. It's a new submission process. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing ever changes. What One, one piece of advice from Laura. Uh, well, I, I love the local perspective because I think that's really key. But I also think getting connected with, with um, the librarians on Twitter or who are going to get you connected to the audience that you're really looking for um, – I mean, a lot of times we like to be advocates for things and, you know, um, be champions of, of... Do you worry about people seeming like carpetbaggers? Oh, uh, that's the other thing I was going to say. For the young people bit, in the audience, a carpetbagger. I, <laughs> I don't want my first interaction to you, no. with you to no. be, hey, do you want to no. buy my book? Yeah. Um, but join in that conversation, and if I feel like you're a partner in the like the comics the advocacy, cause, yeah, yeah the, the cause for kids and comics and reading and all all of that, uh, you know, I'm I, I'm gonna feel like I'm connected to you. You want to feel that sincerity. I want to feel that sincerity. Right. Well, yeah, yeah and, and we've talked about this, when Eli Nyberger was on the show. We've talked about this multiple times. Uh, this notion of uh, Twitter's a cocktail party, right? You don't go to a cocktail party and go, "Here's my business card." <laughs> We're networking. <laughs> you, you actually listen to what's being said. See if you have something interesting to contribute to that. Contribute that to the conversation. People remember a nice thing about you. And then suddenly, oh, hey, guess what? They recognize you. And if it doesn't say Micro Machines, it's not the real thing. <laughs> did, did I do that really well, fast? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And was Stephen McCraney on your show talking yes. about 
putting good into the world and just receiving good back. Yes. And I think that's that's one of the keys to a lot of people that I connected with on Twitter. That's like the golden rule, right? I know. <laughs> yeah. I know. Be nice to people and don't tell lies. Is it really that simple? Uh, but for, for the audience, we mentioned carpetbaggers earlier. Uh, what that refers to is people uh, post-Civil War going down into the South with uh, carpet ba- bags made of carpet material. Here's the glossary. Tr- <laughs> and they would try to profit from uh, war-devastated areas by pretending to be uh, helpful people, but they were not. Look it up in your local library. That's exactly. the librarian for help. Come on, people. Let's get with the There's program. a reference desk upstairs, as a matter of fact. This is a repository of knowledge. Use it. Okay, well, I think we could, we could wrap it up with that. So that was episode 100 at uh, Kids Read Comics 2014. Once again, the game code for this, or the summary game code for this episode is podcast. And even if you're watching online after the fact, you can redeem those points up to a point. I mean, if you're watching this in 2017, I don't know if this will still work. You could try <laughs> and go three, to play only that three area, years away. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to Greg Schiegel of StuffSaidShow.com, HatterEntertainment.com. Thank you to LibLaura5, Laura Given. You can follow her work at LibLaura5.blogspot.com and LibLaura5 on Twitter. Aaron, where can we find the... <laughs> you can follow me on Glory Girl at Twitter. I, I don't Glory know Girl what will happen there. Not but much. <laughs> at AADL on Twitter? Um, at the moment, you can find me moderating the comments at play.aadl.org ah, um, for yes. all of our avid summer players that are... Are playing and, right okay, now. and let me say, okay, uh, now I'm going to be that, that 15-year-old kid again. Oh, Aaron, Ms. Yeah. Uh, can I play if I'm from Alabama? I'm from Florida. Yes, from... the only thing that you can't do is pick up all the awesome prizes that you earn with the points. You can play anywhere? Yeah, anytime? you can. Wow. Yeah. So play.aadl. So, yeah, hopefully you have an Ann Arbor relative or connection, and then Who can they up can pick up your prizes. Your cool swag. Yeah. And uh, there's game codes on all of the different events happening all over the library this week. So people should go around to all the tables over at Artist Alley and stop by all the other programs. And thanks, everybody, for... Uh, How about a hand for Jersey Droz 100 yes. episodes yeah. of this podcast? Huh? 100. Give it up. The maestro, the ringmaster. Okay, well, the thanks for going around. Thanks to the Ann Arbor District Library for yeah. letting me do this thing. 